Wow. So um, last year, uh, when uh, Ashok made the announcement of uh, the new slate of officers, and you know, I certainly knew as president-elect I'd be uh, taking on the mantle of uh, president, uh, I have to tell you, uh, I was so happy uh, and excited that Doug uh, was named vice president because I'd get a year to work with him. And uh, I have tremendous respect uh, for Doug, and I'll talk more about that uh, towards the end of my uh, presentation. But uh, I also, there was a certain level of trepidation that I had knowing that uh, I had played golf so often with Doug that that was undoubtedly going to come up in his introduction. And so I spent most of this past summer working on my golf game. So the last memories Doug would have of my play were somewhat positive ones because, trust me, it could have been a lot worse in terms of... Uh... So in uh, thinking about what I was going to uh, speak to you about today, uh, it really struck me that uh, what's become increasingly important to me uh, in my career as I left uh, the National Cancer Institute uh, where as you all know, I spent a large portion uh, of my time, and I went to Montefiore and Einstein. Uh, it became increasingly apparent to me that uh, the surgeon investigator or the surgeon scientist uh, is at risk. You know, we talk about uh, animals that are on the verge of extinction, uh, and I think our phenotype uh, as surgeon investigators is uh, to some degree under siege, and so I'm often asked by my own residents and fellows, and certainly the residents and fellows within our association, and we had a wonderful time at Endocrine Surgery University uh, this year, how can I, if I am interested in conducting uh, research uh, and performing investigations, how can I do that in the current environment if I want to be a surgeon, you know, if I want to have a productive surgical career. And I'm not going to uh, pretend that I have all the answers, um, but I want to talk a bit about it in the context of my own experiences. Uh, so what I'd like to hit as, a, as an overview of what I'd like to uh, touch on in this address is first off, the surgeon as an investigator. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, and how can one maintain curiosity and investigation within the pressures uh, and issues that surround the practice of surgery uh, in the modern time. The importance of making observations, uh, both at the bedside to bring back to the laboratory and in the laboratory to bring back to our patients, and the powerful importance of the question and the need to ask and in a very systematic way answer questions to make progress. And I think both Sam Wells yesterday and Steve Rosenberg today are amazing examples of the power of the question. And then finally, mentoring an environment and how important that is if we truly want to remain relevant as a field of surgeons in asking and answering questions and how fortunate I've been uh, for the environments I've been able to be a part of and the mentoring uh, that I've had. So I want to tell this story, uh, and uh, as it always has to be, uh, a personal story, through three vignettes uh, that I think encapsulate what my travel uh, through my career uh, has been. And, uh, and each of those different vignettes, I think, uh, highlight an aspect of what I try to get across to my residents and fellows about how you also might be able to maximize and take advantage of, of opportunities. So the first is von Hippel Lindau and an opportunity taken. And uh, that will become uh, more clear as I move through. The second is MEN1 and the challenge accepted. And the third, and I think this is of critical importance, and I think Sam made reference to this yesterday. One thing we can do as surgeons that almost no other practitioner can is control the tissue. You know, we do the operations, we retrieve, whether it's a primary tumor, a metastatic site, and if you control the tissue, you can be a part of, and in some cases, control the science, or more aptly and less abruptly, bank every tumor you resect. And I think that if you begin your career doing that, you'll have no shortage of folks that want to collaborate with you. So first, vignette opportunities. 
This is Marston Lenahan, uh, the chief of the urologic oncology branch. And you all saw a picture of him yesterday. Sam uh, put Marston up there as well. Marston uh, was at Duke uh, when Sam was at Duke. And uh, I think Sam has been a tremendous mentor to Marston. Well, Marston is on a list of important mentors of mine. And you might say, well, how? You know, Marston's a urologist, a urologic oncologist. You're a surgical oncologist and endocrine surgeon. How did that come to be? Well, Marston and his team had recently sequenced the gene for von Hippel-Lindau. And in 1995, there was much excitement in the surgery branch, where Marston was still a senior investigator, caring for patients with VHL, and now with a better understanding of the pathophysiology and mechanism of the disease, looking avidly at new ways to treat these patients. And as all of you know, von Hippel-Lindau is an autosomal dominant uh, uh, condition caused by a tumor suppressor gene or the mutation of a tumor suppressor gene uh, on uh, chromosome 3. And it predisposes individuals to, to a variety of manifestations. And they're listed, and many of you know them already, most commonly renal cell carcinomas. And that's what Marston was interested in. But they had this handful of patients that they had been following in their series with pancreatic lesions. And when I say handful, it was a handful. They had an Excel spreadsheet with literally 12 patients on that Excel spreadsheet that they knew had solid tumors. Many more patients had cysts, but 12 patients with solid tumors. And Marston stopped me in the hallway. This is 1996. I had just joined the senior staff. And he said, you know, we have these patients with these solid tumors in the pancreas, and we don't know what to do with them. I have a spreadsheet. It's kind of bare. It's got 12 patients on it. Do you have any interest at all in taking that spreadsheet, and you can see any patient you want in our clinic, any patients identified on imaging with these lesions, uh, and see what you can find out about them. Ask some questions about how should we follow them, how should we manage them. And so I was a brand new uh, senior staff member. I really hadn't picked a focus yet in terms of what I wanted to work on. And so I said yes. And I think that's an important component of the early part of your career. Now, saying no certainly becomes important as your career progresses because focus is critical. But early on, I think yes can get you further than no. And so I said yes to Marston Lenahan, and he gave me that spreadsheet. And over the last 20 plus years, uh, I have collected information on these patients. And that small list of 12 became 30, became 50, became 100, uh, and now, I think that list of patients uh, that is now followed closely in the endocrine oncology branch by Electron Kabebu and his team uh, is well over 200 uh, patients with one manifestation or another of pancreatic disease. And so what have we learned from that question that Marston asked me, are you interested in learning more about these patients, and the questions that we asked about those patients? Well, we know that cysts are the most common uh, part of uh, this manifestation of the pancreas. And we know that neuroendocrine tumors occur between 12 and 17 percent of the time. But interestingly to me, although we knew these tumors had malignant potential, a very small number of patients actually developed metastatic disease or died of that disease. And when I took over the registry in 1996, we operated on almost all of these patients when we saw these lesions. They were non-functional tumors. In fact, I can say with certainty to this day, I personally have never encountered a functional tumor associated with VHL. Uh, you can see them. You can have two true, true, but unrelated. But I've never seen a functional tumor where you work it up for loss of heterozygosity, the VHL gene, actually have a VHL mutation. So the only reason to operate on a non-functional neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas, in my opinion, is to impact patient outcome, that is, their survival, prevent metastases. But only 8% of patients we're showing metastatic disease. So we began to try to look and see, were there any factors uh, involved in the uh, makeup of these patients, the size of the tumor, rate of growth, gender, location, et cetera, that might help us predict those patients at risk for metastatic disease so we would know who to operate on. So we weren't subjecting patients to unnecessary procedures because these patients have other tumors, renal cell cancers, that can, in fact, lead to their death. CNS lesions, hemangioblastomas, angiomas. I have some patients who I've had the privilege to care for with VHL 
that have undergone eight, nine, ten operations, leaving them blind or deaf depending on uh, the location of their tumors. And you certainly don't want to add the potential morbidity of a Whipple resection or an enucleation to all of those issues uh, that those patients are already dealing with. So we began collecting information on these patients. This is a paper published by Joe Blansfield and presented at an AAES meeting. And you can see that number began to increase past 12 patients in our registry. This was actually uh, a review of 108 patients uh, in our series. And what we found were there were some criteria or some uh, elements uh, of these tumors that did appear to associate to some degree with a poor outcome. We knew that uh, if you had larger lesions, you were more likely to have a metastasis. We knew that if the rate of growth of your tumors, that is that uh, tumors uh, that grew more quickly had a higher association with patients who had metastatic disease. And so we began to look at all of these different factors uh, in these patients and essentially found three that, again, an imperfect study. There was no way to sort of do prospective random assignment trials with these patients as they were few in number and we really didn't have uh, a great idea at the time of what to randomize to. But in following natural history, we found that the size of the lesion was important. Lesions smaller than three centimeters tended not to grow very often and tended almost never to be associated with metastatic disease. We found that if the rate of growth had a doubling time of, of less than 500 days, the patient was more likely to develop advanced stage disease. And we also found that if they had an exon 3 mutation, and this was the weakest of our link, could be associated with more aggressive form uh, of the disease. And we applied then those observations to a criteria to select patients that may or not be candidates for immediate operation. And applying that criteria now over the last 19 years or so, I have not, and I think I can speak for the endocrine oncology branch in their large series that they've taken forward, seen a patient who we have applied these criteria to who later came back with metastatic disease. And so while not a prospective randomized trial, a series of observations and then putting together those observations into a management strategy, I think has saved a lot of patients with VHL from unnecessary operations on their pancreas. And so the lesson here, my takeaway was that you can learn from your patients. If you carefully keep records of them, if you build a database, and it can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet, you don't need complicated data managers and data crunchers. I maintained that VHL database for the first 10 years that I had it, just entering that information on my own. And that taught me quite a bit, not only about VHL, uh, but about other lesions in the pancreas, which we will get to. It, I was so uh, proud and, and, and humbled when Electron approached me not too long ago to ask me to participate in a review that his group uh, led by, uh, at least uh, the review led by a very bright and talented fellow in his laboratory, uh, first author on this paper, uh, to take a look back at all of these criteria as well as some advances that they had made in imaging for patients with VHL. And our original criteria, for the most part, still stand. That is, in the algorithm, lesions less than two to three centimeters are observed with serial imaging. If the rate of growth of those lesions is rapid, those patients are referred for resection. And Electron's team has done some fabulous work with imaging that might give us a window into those tumors with a worse biology, rather than just following them with static cross-sectional imaging. And this now is where that algorithm has evolved over the last 20 years. And my hope is that we've helped patients and we've helped save patients from operations that may not be therapeutic. Well, a similar strategy can be used for other familial uh, cancer syndromes that have as a manifestation pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Certainly, uh, a, an expectant approach has been advocated for quite some time for non-functional lesions associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia. This is a paper uh, from the group, group in Uppsala uh, that suggested that. Uh, a series of guidelines uh, from uh, other groups uh, that have participated in an ENET study 
have essentially recommended that surgery be avoided for non-functional lesions associated with MEN that are less than two centimeters in size and considered strongly for those that are greater than two centimeters or rapidly growing. In fact, uh, Charles Proy's group uh, published their experience, uh, a uh, corresponding member of this uh, uh, association uh, who made tremendous contributions uh, to the field of endocrine surgery, that for patients with MEN1, small, less than two centimeter, non-functioning lesions could be safely followed without uh, impact uh, on those patients. And in fact, the study showed no survival advantage for patients that were operated on with lesions less than two centimeters compared to those who had no surgery. This may seem somewhat esoteric, VHL, MEN1, while all of us in this room see those patients. These patients are rare. They are not the common cases that we see. However, incidental non-functional sporadic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are being seen at increasing frequency. And they're seen because of a use of cross-sectional imaging that is being more widely applied. I, I don't know if your institution is the same as mine, but it's almost impossible to walk into the emergency room at a Montefiore hospital with abdominal pain and not get quickly whisked through a CT scanner. And so the way I see most of my pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors these days are incidentally discovered lesions that are sent to my clinic. And they typically look like this, uh, a hyper-enhancing lesion uh, found in the pancreas, head, body, or tail, this one between the vena cave and the superior mesenteric vein. And the question is what to do about these patients. And the patients are often exceedingly anxious when they find out they have some lesion that's been seen on imaging. And these tumors are increasing in incidence, I think mostly based on cross-sectional imaging, but in part based on other factors. We certainly know that type 1 carcinoids of the, of the stomach are increasing in frequency to some degree based on the use of uh, H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors. By impairing that acid production, the feedback inhibition of gastrin secretion is eliminated, and gastrin, we know, is a potent mitogen for the development of G-cells, and we see G-cell hyperplasia in these patients. Could there be other factors, medications, that might be driving a similar process in the pancreas? And we see that over the last 40 years, the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors has far outstripped in its rate of growth, certainly not numbers of absolute cases, but rate of increase of growth uh, compared to other solid tumor malignancies. These lesions are staged, and they are staged based on a number of factors. This is the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society's TNM staging system based both on size of the primary tumor, extra pancreatic invasion of the lesion, and spread to distant sites. And when you stage these lesions, you can see that those small lesions, the T1 lesions, less than two centimeters in size, these patients do exceedingly well. And stage for stage, as stage migrates to a higher stage, the patients have a poorer life expectancy. But you can see overall that even stage four patients have a overall survival rate that is far longer than most of the other types of pancreatic cancers and other solid tumor epithelial malignancies that we deal with. In fact, median over, overall survival approaches four or five years in these patients, even with advanced stage three or stage four disease. We also know that grade is important. Low grade tumors, uh, zero to five percent, do much better than patients with high grade. Tumor. So what can we learn from these observations? Another observation, and this is one published uh, not too long ago, about five years ago, by the group of Hop at Hopkins doing um, whole uh, genome sequencing of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and GI neuroendocrine tumors, that these sporadic tumors are not all that different from the familial tumors that we see in terms of the genetic mutations that are found. In fact, and this number has gone up a bit with other uh, groups that have done further sequencing analysis, between 40 and 50 percent of sporadic neuroendocrine tumors identified and biopsied harbor an MEN1 mutation. So is it unreasonable, perhaps, to apply some of the lessons learned from the familial cases of neuroendocrine tumors to what we see with these sporadic cases of neuroendocrine tumors? And might we evolve our paradigm 
for the management of non-functional neuroendocrine tumors to something that looks at, as uh, Dr. Shaha pointed out, not necessarily surveillance versus surgery, but surgery now versus surgery when the patient's biology dictates that they may actually require it to make an impact on their outcome. Steve Rosenberg gave a beautiful talk. I'm very thankful to him for, uh, for uh, his generosity in coming here and giving the invited lecture. There is a sign that sits in his office. Uh, and if you're sitting in a chair facing Steve, the sign is over his shoulder. And uh, I, unfortunately, uh, had plenty of opportunities uh, to sit in that chair uh, facing Steve and see that sign over his shoulder. Uh, when he would ask me on occasion if uh, the latest uh, controversy that occurred in the operating room because we didn't have enough OR time or because the case took uh, too long and the anesthesiologists were complaining and I expressed my displeasure in not being able to get the next case on, Steve would lower his glasses and say to me, is this getting us any closer to curing cancer? <laughs> well, it, it, it actually was because those visits to his office burned this plaque into my psyche. And I think about this all the time when I am evaluating a patient for any condition. And I'll just read it, as all of you can read it as well. Surgery is like an armed savage who attempts to get back by force what a more civilized man would get by stratagem. And this was said by a surgeon, Sir John Hunter, in the 18th century, a, a well-respected Scottish surgeon. And I believe this. I believe that surgery is always the easy answer. If you see it and it's bothersome and the patient wants it out, the easy answer is always to just take it out. But are we always helping patients when we do that, as opposed to thinking through the problem, counseling them appropriately, and deciding who will best benefit from our inter uh, intervention? Uh, Clive Grant and his team at the Mayo Clinic, I think, took this issue on as well and, again, presented at this meeting, looked at small, non-functioning, asymptomatic, pancreatic, neuroendocrine tumors and asked the question, again, the importance of asking questions, is there a role for non-operative management? And what they saw in their series of patients, and they had a fairly reasonable size, they had 67 patients that they observed or underwent expectant management, and 60 patients uh, that they uh, operated on, I'm sorry, uh, 77 patients that they observed and 56 patients that they operated on. And what they found is there was absolutely no difference between progression or death from disease between the two groups as long as the lesions were less than two centimeters in size. Another observational study from a group in Europe also looked at a non-operative uh, non approach or an expected management versus operative intervention. And again, following these lesions found that the overwhelming majority of small, non-functional, incidentally discovered pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors never changed in size and never spread. When you look at the morbidity of these operations, even in the most accomplished centers, that morbidity can be as high as 40% with pancreatic leak and fistula being the highest cause of morbidity. So we have to ask ourselves the question, if we operate on all of these lesions, are we really benefiting all of our patients? Our own group uh, looked at our experience at Montefiore and Einstein, and this uh, paper was presented by Alex Rosenberg actually uh, last year uh, at this meeting. And we asked the question, what was the outcome of patients that were observed and then tempered in terms of the uh, approach versus those that were operated on. And once again, for those lesions less than two centimeters in size and that were showing no evidence of growth, we saw no difference in the outcome uh, of our patients. And so I think based on a growing experience, um, we're starting to get some clarity on the answer to this question. Is it completely answered yet? No. I think the best way to address this with, would be a prospective random assignment trial where small lesions are randomized to a group for observation and a group for resection as long as the folks conducting the trial have equipoise around that question. And I believe such a trial is being considered in Europe. 
But I think in my own practice, I follow these guidelines. And I think they're the consensus from the experience and the questions that we've asked and attempted to answer. Small T1, less than two centimeter tumors that are low grade G1 uh, lesions, non-functional, sporadic, uh, can be safely observed. Serial imaging can be obtained at six to 12 month intervals. And if the lesion increases in size, surgery should be considered. And in all cases, if possible, confirmation that the lesion is indeed a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor should be made by either a fine needle aspirate or some other functional imaging that lets you know it's a neuroendocrine tumor, somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, gallium-68 dotatate, et cetera. This is obviously still, though, observational. And can we actually pick up markers, molecular-based markers, that might make this question an obsolete question, that might answer it definitively. That is, a patient with a specific type of biology should certainly get their lesion resected before the lesion is grown. And Tom Fahey and his group at Cornell have begun to focus on this, looking at epigenetic phenomenon. That is methylation of specific promoters in this tumor tissue. Remember the importance of collecting tissue to see whether or not this correlates with outcome for these patients. And methylation and epigenetic phenomenon will become an important theme as I move through this talk, at least with neuroendocrine tumors. And what Tom's team has discovered is that if you have enhanced methylation at the promoter for UCHL1, you will have a greater chance of metastatic potential due to the silencing of the expression of that gene. And this correlates both with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as well as small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. So my hope is that the work being done by Tom's team and other labs across the country might identify for us molecular markers that we can test in these patients that will better stratify those that will benefit from surgery and those that will live their life fully and completely without any consequence from these small incidentally discovered lesions in their pancreas opportunity. Now moving on to challenges. So this is Alan Spiegel. Alan Spiegel uh, is currently the dean at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I went there after him, so Alan did not follow me to Einstein. It was the other way around to some degree. Alan was the scientific director of NIDDK when I first met him in 1995 as a fellow uh, in the surgery branch at the NCI. And he ultimately became the director of NIDDK. But before that happened, Alan was still a very accomplished, accomplished endocrinologist. And Alan and I, and I'm sure Rich Alexander and Doug Fraker had similar experiences, uh, would be on service together. Alan as the endocrinologist, myself as the endocrine surgeon, and would manage patients. And in 1997, a very exciting thing happened. Alan and his team successfully cloned the MEN1 gene. And this was truly exciting as they had been laboring for quite some time to figure out why patients with MEN1 developed the tumors they had and in the tissues that were subjected to that tumor formation. And the cloning of this gene was seen as an amazing opening to try to ask and answer questions about the pathophysiology and mechanism. And I remember distinctly being at an SSO meeting with Rich Alexander. And we worked for the government. And so they encouraged us to cohabitate on meetings. And so Rich and I would often uh, share hotel rooms uh, when we went to the SSO. Uh, fortunately, no pictures exist of either of us watching HBO uh, at those meetings. But I remember specifically uh, Alan Spiegel calling Rich at that meeting to let him know that this paper was going to be published because the gene had been identified in sequence. It was tremendous excitement when we got back to the NIH after that meeting. And Alan Spiegel calls me into his office one day, and we're on service together taking care of patients. And my laboratory at the time was very focused on a number of cytokines, and we had been cloning and expressing in various plasmids the genes that coded for those cytokines as a means of causing uh, transduced changes in tumors for us to better understand tumor microenvironment and tumor vasculature. And so Alan said to me, I know you have experience and an interest in molecular biology, and I have a challenge for you, a proposition. I'd like you to work with us 
to create a knockout mouse of MEN1 because we feel if we can knock out the MEN1 gene in specific tissues, we might be able to learn a little bit more about the pathophysiology of the disease. And so, keeping with uh, what I had advised earlier in the talk, um, I said yes. I had never seen a knockout mouse. I had never been involved with designing or making a knockout mouse, but I knew how to clone things. I knew how to make plasmids. And recently, Brian Sauer, a funded investigator by NIDDK, had developed a technique using Cree recombinase, an enzyme produced by bacteriophage, that can cleave DNA at specific DNA consensus sequences, 34 base pair consensus sequences called LOXP sites. Now this is early days. This is nothing like can be accomplished now with CRISPR technology, et cetera. But I went back to my lab with a handful of papers that Alan had already read, cover to cover, on how to do Cree knockouts. And over the next three years, we developed tissue-specific Cree expressors and flanked LOXP MEN1 mice developed by Judy Crabtree in Francis Collins' lab to generate knockouts of MEN1 uh, in the parathyroid and the pancreas. And I'm going to not talk so much about the parathyroid mouse, even though that's the first mouse that we uh, created um, and has gone on to uh, make its way across the world, in fact, with folks uh, understanding the calcium sensing receptor a little bit better because they can use uh, the PTH Cree knockout to selectively delete in the parathyroid. But for the purposes of our talk today, I'm going to focus on our workhorse mouse that has really generated much of the interest and questions that have continued in my laboratory, our pancreas-specific knockout. So essentially what we did, for those that are not familiar with the Cree recombinase system, is we developed a tissue-specific Cree expressor driven by the PDX promoter. PDX1 is an early promoter in pancreatic lineage. It's turned on in both exocrine cells and endocrine cells early on, but it turns off shortly before birth in exocrine cells. But what's most important when you're using it to drive Cree recombinase is that it's on during embryologic development because that's when your, you know, your genes will be knocked out if they're flanked by a LOXP site. And so essentially what we did is we created this mouse that expressed Cree selectively in the pancreas, both exocrine and endocrine. We crossed it to mice that had their MEN1 gene flanked by these LOXP sites, and in fact, the genes were deleted. We were able to delete the coding exons from the MEN1 gene. And what resulted was the loss of menin, the protein product of MEN1, selectively in the pancreas of these mice. And we were able to show that by Western blot showing loss of menin in the homozygous deleted mice. And what did you get? Well, fortunately, we got a phenotype because I've made many mice, uh, knockout mice, that did not develop a phenotype, and I was exceedingly lucky in that the first two mice we made in my laboratory, the parathyroid knockout and the pancreas knockout, actually had a phenotype. But I can tell you the next six did not. And so uh, it was, you know, most of my postdocs were like, how can this be possible? We must be doing something wrong. But we just got lucky. The dice rolled and we saw phenotype early on. Uh, that's the way it is sometimes in science. And I tell this again uh, to my fellows and anyone else who's willing to listen. If you want exact, be a physicist, not a biologist. This is our mouse. Um, head is pointing up, feet are down. Uh, GI tract has uh, been ex, uh, uh, placed uh, outside of the abdomen. And here's the tumor uh, in the tail of the pancreas. And these tumors look for all the world like human tumors uh, from uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And when you look at these, uh, in the uh, control mice, you see normal-sized islets. In the knockout mice, you see hyperplastic islets that are much larger. And if you follow these mice out, they develop neuroendocrine tumors, hypervascular neuroendocrine tumors. And for the most part, these tumors secrete insulin. And that's real important because you can use it as a nice biomarker for the presence of the tumors and also follow the tumors for response by looking at insulin levels. And also, conveniently, these mice die a lot earlier than their matched litter mates, and we know that these tumors therefore can progress. You can image them. These are PET scans of mice with these neuroendocrine tumors, and you can see them lighting up, FDG PET. The KI-67 of these tumors is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, so they're G2 tumors, and therefore can be imaged uh, by PET scanning. 
And you can obtain MRIs of these mice, and you can see that they do develop liver mets, and they develop them at about the frequency you would expect liver mets to form in MEN1 patients. About 15 to 20 percent of them develop liver metastases. So what can you do with these mice? What sort of questions can you ask with these mice now that we have them as a reagent? And so one avenue of investigation we've taken is can we use these mice to mimic human disease? Because it's very difficult, as all of you know, to run clinical trials on patients with rare tumors. It takes a long time to do, both to accrue the patients, and especially with slow-growing tumors like this, it takes a long time to get the answers. And so we felt if we had a model system where we can trial agents ahead of time and then select the ones that look most promising, perhaps we can shorten the timeline of vetting those agents for their benefit to patients. And so one series of experiments we did in the laboratory was with a somatostatin receptor uh, binding agent, a uh, triotide or uh, somatostatin analog, pazureotide, long-acting depot agent with enhanced binding to so somatostatin receptors 2 and somatostatin receptor 5. Binding of these receptors not only decreases secretion, but inhibits proliferation of those cells. We tested our mice and we found that they did in fact express somatostatin receptors in these neuroendocrine tumors in the MEN1 knockout mice. So we administered pazureotide as a monthly injection in these mice and found that it lowered the insulin levels in these animals. Consequently, glucose levels came back up as a surrogate for tumor response. It resulted in a decrease in the size of these tumors, significant reduction when compared to those treated with control, and most importantly, improved survival in these animals. And this was presented at this meeting several years ago by Thomas Quinn, a very precocious medical student in our laboratory who's now gone into radiation oncology as a field. And Thomas presented this uh, paper so eloquently and so much better than I'm using this data to present now that he was awarded uh, the prize for best basic science paper that year. But what's important is a similar trial was subsequently conducted in patients with another uh, octreotide-like agent or long-acting somatostatin analog called lanreotide in patients with both pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and GI neuroendocrine tumors that showed an improvement in progression-free survival. And as a result of the clinical trial, Lanreotide is now approved for the treatment of these patients. So a validation that perhaps these models can be used as a window into agents that may show their efficacy once brought to the clinic. And so as a result, we're using this mouse now to test a variety of different agents. We've tested new uh, dual torque inhibiting uh, mTOR inhibitors. We've tested other uh, somatostatin-like uh, uh, analogs. We've tested uh, VEGF and other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But what I'm most excited about is a series of experiments we're conducting now with a nano platform. This is a gold nanoparticle produced by a company called Cytomune Sciences uh, in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. And this particle has attached to it irreversibly a TNF protein and then attached to it with a cleavable linker a paclitaxel analog. And these particles can selectively traffic to tumor based on the observation that tumors have a more porous or leaky vasculature compared to normal vessels, a so-called enhanced permeability effect. And these particles leak out of the vessels and then are accumulated in the tumor tissue. And when they get there, enzymes, caspases, that are present in the tumor microenvironment cleave the linker and release the paclitaxel selectively at the tumor site. We've administered this agent uh, to our neuroendocrine tumor mice, our MEN1 knockout mice, and shown that the transfer of this particle selectively to the tumor bed results in an enhanced vascular leakiness due to the effects of TNF. This is all dynamic enhanced MRI imaging showing a significant delta in diffusion of the contrast compared to baseline. And this is not seen in normal tissues. When we do MRI on normal tissues, we don't see this enhancement. We can actually see the particles, since they're dense gold nanoparticles, doing CT scans on mice. We can see the accumulation of the particles selectively in the tumors in the pancreas. And we know where the tumors are by doing uh, PET scanning as well to show the high intensity location of that tumor in the midline. 
and the accumulation of these nanoparticles. And most importantly, delivery of paclitaxel bound to these particles and cleaved through the cleavage of this linker results in a significant decrease in insulin levels, a tumor biomarker in these mice, compared to the controls. And so again, I think this model holds promise as a means of querying new therapeutics before we bring them to the clinic. So a challenge from Alan Spiegel to create a knockout mouse to figure things out about MEN1 gave us a tool to ask completely different questions about therapeutics that we may bring to our patients. My final vignette, tissue as a resource. I think biorepositories are incredibly important, and I learned this uh, from uh, my mentors uh, in the surgery branch uh, at the NCI, Rich Alexander, Doug Fraker, that every patient you operate on uh, is an important uh, resource, uh, not only with respect to the respect you pay to the patient and the care that you give, but the partnership you create with that patient to help you advance science and ask and answer questions, and you are obliged and obligated to use that resource responsibly. And this is actually one of the most straightforward ways that someone interested in getting involved in the field of being a surgeon investigator or a surgeon scientist can actually get involved. And that is by creating a, if you don't already have a biorepository at your institution and a standardized consent, the first protocol you should write is a tissue procurement protocol. It's actually the first protocol I've written at each of the two institutions I've had the privilege of uh, spending time during my professional career. First protocol I wrote at the NCI was a tissue procurement protocol for endocrine tissues. First protocol I wrote when I got to Montefiore was a tissue procurement protocol. And I was fortunate that when I left the NCI, they let me take that biobank with me, and I've built on it since I arrived at Montefiore, and we now have close to 3,000 annotated prospective samples of patients with various endocrine tumors. So what has that allowed us to do? It's allowed us to have great collaborations, number one. There are always way too many questions to ask to just ask them yourself. And another thing I learned from Steve Rosenberg was it's important to communicate and to publish. Secret science is not good science. The patients deserve to know progress being made in other laboratories. And so I have freely shared the resources that we've had in the laboratory, the tissues that we've collected, the mice that we've developed, so others can ask questions that we would just never have the time or resources to ask on our own. So I had a collaboration with Steve Marks and his group in NIDDK, providing tissues back to them that we had resected, where they determined that mutations in the CDK N2C P18 and P19 may cause sporadic parathyroid adenomas as a result of studying those tissues. I had a collaboration with the group at Yale, a great collaboration where I shared aldosteronomas that we had collected both at the NCI and at Montefiore, which allowed them through uh, sequencing and through uh, uh, analysis of both somatic and germline mutations to identify a calcium channel mutations in aldosterone producing adenomas. Again, not my work per se, we did not do this in my lab, but I got to collaborate with them, create new uh, exchange of information based on tissue banking and having that tissue. In my own laboratory, though, having collected these tissues and made these uh, knockout mice uh, has allowed me to ask a question that's vexed me from the minute I began studying MEN1 and Alan Spiegel, Francis Collins, and their group uh, cloned and uh, sequenced the gene. And that is why when MEN1 is mutated in patients, do we see tumors in only certain tissues, but not every tissue? You know, MEN1 acts like a tumor suppressor gene, and so mutation in a tumor suppressor should result in an increased incidence of cancer. But yet, we don't see an increased incidence of pancreatic adenocarcinoma, colon cancer, lung cancer in these patients. We see very specific manifestations. Pituitary adenomas, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, hyperparathyroidism, uh, angiolipomas of the skin. Well, why are there certain tissue predilections for neoplasia as a result of MEN1 knockout? And that's been an area of investigation that my lab has been pursuing now for the last 10 years. And these PDX knockout mice are a very important resource for that because, as I said early on, they knock the MEN1 gene out of exocrine pancreas as well as endocrine pancreas. 
but they don't get exocrine tumors. So even though both copies of MEN1 are lost in those exocrine cells, they don't develop adenocarcinomas in those tissues. That's an interesting question, one that we have not answered yet. But we think we're starting to get on the road to having an idea of the direction we should go in to answer that question. And it's based on having stored tissue, amazingly enough. So we took parathyroids. We have a whole freezer full of adenomas, MEN1 parathyroids, normal parathyroids, and we used the phone a friend technique to get as many parathyroid carcinomas as we could. And we looked at these human tissues to see if there was any difference between these various types of parathyroid neoplasia and normal parathyroid tissue with respect to the epigenome. And I'll tell you what I expected is not what we found. What I expected is that you'd see the most perturbation in parathyroid cancers and that hyperplasia and adenoma would be somewhere on a spectrum between normal and carcinoma. And that's not what we saw. What we saw was the most perturbation in terms of epigenetic phenomenon was actually in MEN1 parathyroids. In fact, MEN1 parathyroids were uniformly hypermethylated, almost across the genome, compared to normal parathyroids, adenomas, and parathyroid cancers. And these are called whisker plots for obvious reasons. And the comparison of MEN1 to normal, adenoma to normal, carcinoma to normal, you can see that the largest whisker on this whisker plot is the MEN1 tissue. And here it's uh, uh, projected graphically across all of the chromosomes. Uh, uh, and you can see the green coloring shows hypermethylation. Red is hypomethylation. And in the center are all of our MEN1 samples. And in fact, using principal component analysis to try to segregate the nodes of this relationship, we saw that all of our MEN1 tissue segregated together and the adenomas and carcinomas actually, to some degree, segregated with each other. We didn't have enough carcinoma samples to see if there was a completely independent node, but they were mostly mixed up among each other. However, and it is hard to see, there's a little asterisk on this uh, diagram for an adenoma that's segregated with the MEN1 tumors. So we sequenced that adenoma and found that it had an MEN1 mutation. And when we went back and sequenced the other adenomas that did not segregate, none of them had a mutation that changed the coding region of MEN1. So something about loss of MEN1 leads to hypermethylation. But what? What is it? So now we moved from our tissues exclusively to include also our knockout mice, because we had both knockouts of the parathyroid, I mentioned those earlier, as well as knockouts in the pancreas. And we looked to see what related to methylation was perturbed with loss of MEN1 in menin. And what we found was D DNA methyltransferase 1, which is the most active enzyme for promoter methylation, was highly upregulated after loss of MEN1. In fact, not just upregulated with respect to mRNA expression, but in terms of enzymatic activity that in fact the expression of DNA methyltransferase was so high in both our human MEN1 knockout tissue and our mouse MEN1 knockout tissue that it explained this hypermethylation. When we knocked down DNA methyltransferase or gave an inhibitor of methylation, we could completely reverse this observation. So what does that mean? You know, we're seeing hypermethylation. You don't typically see hypermethylation in cancers. You see hypomethylation, and it makes some intuitive sense because when you lose methylation, you express genes that can then drive tumorigenesis that otherwise would be silenced. But in fact, when we looked at what pathways were most affected by this hypermethylation that we were seeing in the MEN1 uh, tissues, it was the SOX pathway. And yes, when they were hypermethylated, SOX expression was turned down. And what does SOX do? Well, what SOX does is it regulates beta-catenin. And when you lost uh, the drive of SOX to inhibit beta-catenin expression, when hypermethylation decreased SOX expression, wind signaling went up. And wind signaling is associated with enhanced proliferation as we see in neuroendocrine tumors and other uh, endocrine uh, malignancies. 
So we think now that we have a foothold on understanding a mechanism. But how about the tissue specificity? Why does this happen in endocrine-related tissue but not exocrine? And the logical question to ask me is, well, Steve, you knocked out MEN1 in the exocrine pancreas and the endocrine pancreas. Do they also become hypermethylated? And the answer is no. Loss of MEN1 in exocrine pancreas does not result in hypermethylation. And this is a recently published work of ours uh, in uh, Ankar Target uh, last month. So what do we think is going on? Well, what I don't have time to tell you is additional studies have shown that a binding protein called RBBP5 binds to the promoter of DNMT1 and is also a binding partner of menin, the protein product of MEN1. And when menin is present, it prevents RBBP5 from acting as an enhancer or activator for DNA methyltransferase 1. But when you lose menin, RBBP5 is able to, in an unsuppressed way, drive the expression of DNMT1. And what we believe, our new hypothesis that we are now investigating, is there are tissue-specific factors that play a role in this uh, relationship that in tissues where those factors are not present, loss of MEN1 does not allow activation of RBBP5, but in tissues where it is present, that activation can take place. And that's the subject of a whole series of new questions that we're asking now. So some final thoughts. I think it's important if you're entering a career uh, in academic surgery and you want investigation or research to be a part of it, that you essentially need these three components to be successful, and I've certainly had them in my career in spades. You need inspiration. You need inspiration from the people around you, from your patients, and the questions yet answered. You need teamwork. You can't do this on your own. Especially nowadays, in the environments that we exist in, a team has to be involved if you're gonna do clinical work and research. There's just no way to do it on your own. And this is the message not so much to uh, the, the young attendings in the audience or the fellows in residence, but to all of us who have gray hair or loss of hair that have leadership positions in our departments and in our health systems. Science and discovery must be valued by departments of surgery and health systems. They have to see the value in future discovery and the asking and answer of questions. It's not all about the volume of work we can do. Because if, if it is, then we as a procedural discipline, as surgeons, are gonna be left out of the activity of answering and asking, uh, asking and answering questions. Inspiration. Uh, I had the privilege of, uh, of going to medical school at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and of being in a department that valued thinking out of the box. And I had three principal influences, inspiration and mentors at Columbia that dramatically impacted my career trajectory. Paul Legerfo, who all of you know and respect, a past president of this organization, was a real out-of-the-box thinker. The stuff that Paul did in the 80s and early 90s are the things we now think are innovative. And Paul often paid a price for that in terms of uh, criticisms at Grand Rounds or at M&M uh, conferences. But Paul really inspired me, and he's the person who got me interested in the questions uh, around endocrine surgery. The fact that as an endocrine surgeon, you weren't just a technician. You were an endocrinologist who could operate. I say that all the time to Norman Fleischer, who's the chief of endocrinology at Einstein, and he says, does that mean I'm an endocrinologist that can operate? <laughs> And I always answer, you said it, I didn't. So it's okay. <laughs> In the middle is Roman Noigrod. Now, Roman Noigrod's a vascular surgeon. You may say again, well, what does a vascular surgeon have to do with inspiring you? Roman Noigrod in 1993 was the chief of general surgery at Columbia. And he called me into his office one day and he said, you know, we'd like you to join the faculty when you're done with your residency. This sort of stuff happened back then. I don't know how often it happens now, but this sort of stuff happened back then. And I was like floored. I was like, what do you mean? You know, I, last, I, got, I just got yelled at by the chief resident that I you know, didn't uh, have his patient pre opt appropriately, and you're telling me you want me to stay on the faculty. And he asked me, what do you want to do? What do you want to do when you come back you know, after uh, taking some additional training? 
He said, think about it. Now let me know in the next day or two. And so I came back a day or two later. I said, I want to be a transplant surgeon. That sounds like fun, and the cases are fun to do. And he said, no, that's not a good idea. <laughs> he said, you know, you're not going to be happy. You're going to be out in the middle of the night harvesting organs, stuff like that. And a lot of the most important questions are already being asked and answered. I said, OK. I left again. Two days later, I came back. I said, I want to be a surgical oncologist. He said, good answer. So you're going to go and you're going to do a fellowship at the end of your five years of residency, and then you're going to come back and you're going to help us to build a division of surgical oncology. I said, terrific. And he said, and you're going to work with Paul Legerfo and John Chabot when you come back. And I could not have imagined a better opportunity. John and I were very close during residency. We're not that far apart. And he had already started his practice with Paul and was building what would become the preeminent pancreas program in the Northeast. I mean, John has really made an incredible impact in New York. And so I was very excited, finished my residency, and then went off to the National Cancer Institute uh, to do my surgical oncology fellowship with the plan that I'd spend two years there and then come back and be the junior partner in Legerfo and Chabot's practice. But things started to go really well at the NCI, and I was really enjoying myself. And Steve Rosenberg, as he mentioned in this morning's talk, I think mainly influenced by Rich Alexander, offered me a position on the senior staff. And I remember that phone call to Paul and John like it was yesterday. And I said, you know, I may need a little bit more time. And Paul immediately said, no problem. Sounds great. In fact, you'll be even more valuable. And I called Roman Noigrad. He said the same thing. And I called John Chabot, and there was a moment of silence on the other end of the phone at first, as John had been, I think, licking his chops that a more junior guy would be coming to take some of the call that he was having to take. <laughs> but with tremendous respect and admiration, I have to say that John said to me, this is the right thing for you to do, even though it was going to mean there was more time that he was going to have to shoulder that load. So you need people like this in your life that are going to think of you equally with themselves, and in some cases even above themselves, if they think that opportunity is going to be of benefit for you. And I certainly had that with Paul, Roman, and John. I didn't think this was going to pause me like this, but it, but it does. So this is um, 1995 to 2001. Rich Alexander with more hair, me with more hair, and Bartlett still with hair. This was uh, a group um, and a time uh, that I will never forget. This was some of the most formative years of my uh, time in my profession because the three of us uh, were literally uh, three bodies, one mind. Uh, we worked together seamlessly whether it was science, whether it was clinical work. Uh, I always knew that if I was in the OR, I can call either of these guys, and they would drop whatever they would do and come and help me out. And I think, I hope, they knew the same was true for me. And the same was true in the lab. We shared everything. We were on all each other's protocols. We took care of all the patients together. And it was because of that that I was able to perform some of the work that I presented to you earlier. And I, again, my advice to those of you starting out is find partners like this, folks that will work together with you seamlessly, hand in glove, to allow you to reach the potential that you can reach. Now, Rich and Dave weren't the only folks at the NCI and in the surgery branch that played their, that role for me. In fact, I may not have ever wound up in the surgery branch had it not been for our vice president who introduced me, Doug Fraker. Doug was so enthusiastic and excited when I interviewed there to be a fellow about TNF and the limb perfusions they were doing that it was absolutely infectious. And I was convinced that this was the place for me and so excited the spring of my chief resident year, when I went to lunch with Dr. Holly DeBass, who was our visiting professor, and Ken Ford, who was one of my mentors. And at lunch, Dr. DeBass said to me, well, Dr. Labuti, what are you doing next year after you leave your surgical residency? And I said, I'm going to the NCI, and I'm working with Doug Fraker. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, Doug Fraker's going to Penn. I was like, 
what? <laughs> but it all worked out. I still got to develop a relationship with Doug, and I worked with Rich Alexander, who was one of the most fabulous mentors anyone could have, uh, both in the operating room and in the laboratory. Rich has taught me more than I will ever be able to uh, repay him for, and so I thank him for that. Another person up here wearing a mask, and for the longest time I didn't even know what she really looked like because I only saw her with a mask on, is Maureen George, who was my scrub nurse uh, for the entire time that I was at the NCI. And Maureen is here. Thank you, Maureen, for coming today uh, in the front row. And I have to thank Maureen, and I also hope for the uh, fellows in residence and young attendings that are starting their careers that they have someone like Maureen in their life. After I left the NCI, I was tasked at Montefiore with setting up a cancer center, getting my lab funded. I had never applied for a grant before, before I got out of the NCI. Uh, most of you know in the intramural program we don't have to apply for grants, but at Einstein that was not the case. And so uh, there was immediate pressure on generating some grant support to keep my science going and building a clinical practice. And as all of you know, setting up your operative practice, if you move to a new institution, can be daunting. The nurses don't know how you do things, the OR doesn't run the way you're used to it, and you've got all these other things to do. Maureen and her husband Ray, uh, by extension, because he's the one who had a driver to the train station, traveled up to the Bronx once a week for two and a half years to scrub with my team on Tuesdays and to set up the operating room. You, you can't find people like that and friends like that, but if you can, keep them. Because that type of relationship and loyalty is extremely valuable. I also have here, obviously, Steve Rosenberg, and you all heard when he gave his talk, he's quite an inspiring, uh, inspiring guy. I learned so much from him about asking and answering questions, about being focused, uh, about trying not to get distracted. I'm easily distracted, so it was a challenge for me. Jim Pinkpank, who came after Dave Bartlett left, was a fabulous partner, and Mary Beth Hughes, who joined us while Jim was there and then was my partner after Jim left, uh, is here today as well and uh, did a tremendous job and continues to do a tremendous job. My present team at Montefiore uh, Health System, Rob Mitchler, who I did my residency with at Columbia, recruited me uh, to Montefiore and is a tremendous supporter. You need supportive chairs, and as you're picking jobs, you need to try to determine that. If your chair is not supportive of science and investigation, and you can't find anyone else that does that, that's probably not the place for you to go if that's what you want to do. My partner now, Amanda Laird, who is fabulous uh, and really allows me again to continue to explore uh, because I know that the clinical practice that we both strive to build is in great shape. Uh, Norm Fleischer, Chief of Endocrinology, a great partner and referrer. Ed Rowland, someone who I just recruited. Monique White, my nurse practitioner, is here in the audience tonight, allows me uh, to know that our patients are well cared for after surgery and before surgery. And finally, some of my former colleagues, um, Pen Penny Andriopoulou, uh, uh, Heidi Del Rivero, and David Hughes, who's here, uh, were uh, outstanding. I want to thank my team from this year. Uh, being uh, uh, the president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons has been uh, one of the true highlights of my career. Uh, I, I'm still, uh, it's hard for me to believe uh, that uh, I got to do this for a year and the year went by so fast. Um, Peter, you're going to have a great time and it's going to be uh, over in a blink, so enjoy every minute of it. Doug, it's been an absolute privilege to work with you this year. Uh, Becky, you know, I don't know what to say. Becky is outstanding. Uh, and I'll say more about that uh, at the gala tonight. But uh, I could not have imagined having a better partner uh, in this last year. And I thank you sincerely uh, for all of your hard work. Cord, a rock. Uh, Cord, uh, man, if any of you have your abstract, I mean, your manuscript's outstanding. I, I don't know what to say, because this guy's going to just uh, mess you up. So I suggest you get them in on time. <laughs> Uh, past presidents on the council were always available for advice uh, during uh, this year, and certainly the members of the council were absolutely terrific and worked extremely hard. James Lee, terrific job with the program. Uh, really, really amazing. It's been so enjoyable so far. I really, truly feel like, uh, you know, Groucho Marx, you know, how can I be a member of this club? I certainly don't deserve it. And I certainly feel like I've stood 
on the shoulders of giants, uh, and I am humbled and in awe of the folks that have preceded me as president of this organization. And many of the past presidents are in the audience today, and I can't tell you what that means to me uh, in terms of standing up here. This is the only association, essentially, that I've dedicated uh, uh, effort, time, uh, and uh, emotion uh, into. Steve Rosenberg used to say to us all the time that we shouldn't get too caught up in associations because it was a distraction from the laboratory and the clinic, et cetera. This has never been a distraction. Um, many of my best ideas, both clinical and in the laboratory, have come from interacting with all of you, and I truly treasure and appreciate that. You need a good home team also. I know I'm running a little over, but uh, grant me just a couple of more minutes. Uh, this is my first family, uh, my mom, who's here uh, in the audience today, and my dad, who unfortunately passed away uh, 23 years ago. Uh, my sister Eileen, who my grandfather, who had a very odd sense of humor, is kind of uh, dealing with, and some say I inherited a little bit about that, I don't know, uh, and my grandmother. Uh, you have to come from good roots, uh, and I did. Um, much of my ability, if I have any ability to speak from the podium without saying um and uh and stuttering, comes from my mom, who's a third grade school teacher and would criticize me all the time. Why are you saying um? So I mainly invited her today to make sure I wouldn't uh, during the talk. My family, so my wife Mary, my daughter Christina, who's here today, my son Michael, and my daughter Melissa, are really the treasures. The greatest science experiment I think I've ever been a part of is Mary and my experiment with, uh, with our children, which has been fabulous, and I am proud of all three of them. Uh, they just are absolutely uh, terrific. Strive to make good decisions. Best advice I can give from this entire talk, and the best decision I ever made was to run slow enough so Mary could catch me. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> As, uh, as, as, Rich, as Rich Alexander always says, I married up, and I certainly did. Uh, Mary is just the greatest partner one could ever have. Uh, anything that I've been able to do, I've been able to do because of all she does. Uh, she's uh, amazing. A pediatric physical therapist who, when we moved from uh, Maryland to New York, spent two years and got her doctorate degree. She has an amazing practice, takes care of kids with special needs on the spectrum, kids with uh, cerebral palsy. At the same time, handles the house and the kids and all of that. I'm completely, as Mary will tell you, I'm inept when it comes to doing anything around the house. And so the fact that she's able to do all of that is absolutely amazing. So I am done now for all of you who are really hungry, but I want to thank you for truly honoring me and humbling me with the privilege of being your 35th president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, and I thank you for your patience and indulgence with this address. Thank you.